Good morning, and um, there are bright lights here, so I don't quite see the faces, but I think somehow that you are actually the lucky ones, uh, not because you come and listen to me, uh, but because we are living in a very interesting times. If I'm speaking from the perspective of my professional career, which is consulting and the consumer goods and the telecom, I never seen the times which are promising that much as the era which is about to unfold in front of us. Last four or five years, we saw a massive change which was happening on the infrastructure, on the networks, and the whole telecom industry actually is undergoing currently a massive transformation. We see that the voice, which was, and still is, arguably, bread and butter of the telecom industry, voice and messaging, grew only twofold in terms of data. Of course, quality improved and uh, everything which was linked to it. But the data itself grew dramatically by 14-fold. And arguably, this is just the beginning. The next four years actually will be a critical change for all the operators and all the industry how to deal network-wise, technology-wise, uh, business model-wise with this type of growth. The drivers which are currently sort of driving all this, they are typical, usual suspects. We look at more mobile subscriptions, we look at uh, penetration of smartphones, we look at uh, ongoing increase in coverage, but the most important is actually this. I'm looking at this slide again and again and again, and it keeps fascinating me. Uh, because if you look at the pace with which industry was developing, uh, it took us 100 years to get to one billion connected places, to lay the copper, to put the switches, to telephonize the world, or rather a small part of the world. It took us 25 years. That, actually, I'm not entirely uh, in agreement with the numbers on this slide. But if you think about it, mobile telephony started in the mid-70s. GSM been kicked off uh, in mid-90s. First billion we've been celebrating by GSM in 2005. Ten years. Ten years it took us to reach billion. The next billion came within a year and a half. Now we're facing already kind of plateauing of the penetration of human penetration, but we're still enjoying very rapid growth of data uh, devices, data link devices. And yet what is coming is eclipsing all of it. We're talking about order of magnitude change. We can be too bold, not too bold. I mean, I saw projections more aggressive than this, slightly less aggressive than this, but doesn't change anything. It's an order of magnitude uh, difference. Why are we certain that Internet of Things will happen now, in the next four years? And that's what we're talking about, right? Sort of the perspective of four or five years from now. Because three things came into place lately. The telecom operator has been building for 20 years, relentlessly, uh, very robust and ubiquitous infrastructure. Finally, it is there. We're talking that by the end of... Uh, 2020, 2019, we'll have more than 90% of territory of the planet covered and being connected. 
We also empowered everybody with incredible devices. I think that the massive shift actually happened in about 2007 when simultaneously iPhone been introduced for the first time with the massive computing power crammed into a little device with completely different power of the screen, as well as HSPA been introduced, where 3G and broadband became actually a reality rather than a concept. So the penetration of the devices enhanced by the broadband capabilities, both fiber and mobile broadband, created a second element, which allows us to talk about IoT. And the third one, of course, is the cloud, where we have very low cost, very flexible, massive computing capacity available to us on demand. And those factors actually uh, make us pretty certain that we will be dealing with completely different uh, reality, which we'll call network society. Network society is not an ability of connecting a single device. That we already know how to do. But rather, we're talking about complex platforms which are interconnected, intertwined, and uh, it becomes basically a fabric of our lives. One can draw a lot of pictures, one can discuss it, implications on the industries, and, and so on. This, is, this subject is uh, limitless. You can go as far as Skynet uh, in your imagination. But more interesting is to look what actually will happen in reality with uh, the networks, with the operators, and what will it give to you as entrepreneurs, uh, startups, and how you should think about your road for the next uh, four or five years. Of course, the biggest change which everybody is discussing now is 5G. 5G should make it happen. How can we handle, actually, this order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude change in number of devices? Here are the typical kind of well-known parameters which the industry accepting and taking as a uh, prerequisites for a 5G development. As you can see that most of it deals with fairly uh, standard dimensions which we always discuss. Speed, latency, and so on. There are more interesting ones, for example, 10 times battery life. Uh, but by and large, most of the discussions are going around pretty standard parameters of the network. However, I think that the change which underpins our transition to the network society is deeper. If you look back, we see that operators uh, been building their networks as a standard product, and actually our demand been more predetermined by the capabilities of the network rather than the other way around. Operators knew that there is a standard product called voice, SMS, and you need to drive it as fast as possible. Adoption rates were phenomenal. The economics, which were based on uh, old copper uh, type industry, were very, very accommodating, and therefore it was actually a bonanza. And there was no real incentive, neither there was a capability actually, for the operators to diversify and innovate and develop the offerings which would be radically different between, let's say, consumer and the industry. There were a little pet projects, how to install a few uh, meters here and there, but the bulk of the industry was about voice and about messaging, and still is. Those of you who were at the uh, speech yesterday by Zuckerberg, they could really witness it, right? I mean, so when uh, Frederick Baxos, uh, chairman of GSMA, uh, was explaining to Zuckerberg that, look, we cannot do it, we cannot push internet because it's going to cannibalize our bread and butter. However, things are changing. Things are changing very fast. And uh, what I was talking about a bit earlier, that we now look at the completely different structure of the networks. Total IP based, which means that uh, it's uniform, it's global, uh, it's very easy to interconnect different parts of the network, power of the devices, the different uh, things which are getting connected. All of this create a different infrastructure which actually turns around the picture. And now operators are under pressure 
to deliver and reconfigure and figure out how to accommodate that massive growth which is coming like an avalanche, like a tsunami onto them, but they don't know how to deal with it. Because it's not only about simple standard products, it's not only about the utility, it's about a lot of other issues which industry actually never uh, encountered on its, uh, on its way. When we talk about the drivers, and the most, the sexiest, the easiest thing to talk about, these two things, wearables and the video. Yes, indeed, video currently is accounted almost for 50%, and certainly will be accounted for 50% in the near future of all the traffic on the net. There are 15 billion devices uh, anticipated which will be handling video. And uh, already next year, uh, CEO of Ericsson, Hans, uh, gave a projection actually in his speech earlier this week that we anticipate as Ericsson that already this year will be more streaming uh, than analog viewing. I'm not sure how to call it, right? Sort of the big screen, uh, which is connected. So the streaming will take over and that trend will continue. This defines, of course, the discussion that what is 5G? 5G should be uh, very fast and very low latency, and uh, we need to handle 4K, and so on, so on, so on. However, the new things which are coming onto us, this IoT, the driverless cars, the medical monitors, the safety, all the industrial issues, they pose a completely different challenge for the industry. Think about a driverless car. You cannot all of a sudden drop the call. If, as a consumer, you can redial, as a driverless car, you cannot, and so on. So all of a sudden, industry is facing this. How, as a consumer industry, which was, you know, that originally mobile telephony is a probability-based service. You might get it, might not, uh, depending on how busy the cell is and so on. How from that, which is essentially consumer-driven uh, type of service, we move to industrial reliability of nine nines. How from, uh, okay, there are many phones, but they're pretty much the same. Very well understood standards. Every uh, vendor of the equipment tests virtually all the phones. And therefore, we know perfectly well how to cope the phones and the network. Now we're moving to unpredictable type of devices with completely different power, with completely different sophistication, with completely different requirements. And how to marry those things is actually not clear yet. That's a challenge which is much more uh, demanding than just to increase speed and deal with latency. There are many ways to go about it. And uh, there are many discussions that to create a dedicated networks and uh, to break the internet into different uh, parts and pieces and so on. I think that if we've learned anything from the past 20 year experience, it's that one network should stay intact. That proliferation of spectrum allocation would be actually devastating for the efficiency of the network and efficiency of the industry, as well as the speed of development of the infrastructure and rollout and so on. That we cannot allow uh, creating dedicated sub-networks and uh, deal with those uh, issues in a uh, fragmented way. It's not only the networks which need to adapt and clear that uh, networks will deal uh, through this adaptation with what I forgot to say about it, what is called now SDN, right? So it will be absolutely uh, separated abstract level which defines different services on the network and that's why industry is opening itself for more competition. Wherever it's assumed software and something abstract and where you can write a code, all of a sudden there are many more players which can enter and can compete on that network. So operators actually, as well as vendors, uh, need to think through how to compete in those environments. What is the value added? 
If we come back to the operators, operators were very good at a few things. They were very good at building the networks, rolling base stations fast, and uh, putting fiber into the ground as fast as possible. They were very good at authenticating uh, subscribers. And that was a difference between until Facebook came uh, with more identities and until the sophistication of uh, cookies and so on improved online. But telcos were excellent at authenticating and billing uh, the subscribers. Nobody matches it. If you think about how many conversations you have during the day and multiply it by a few billion, uh, or let's say each operator would have large operators, a few hundred million of subscribers by placing 10, uh, maybe 20 calls, you will get a uh, number of transactions they're handling daily. Some of them are in real time, particularly if we're talking about large operators in the emerging markets, like my former company or you take Chinese companies. Uh, that's an amazing capacity. Amazing skill, which is unique to the operators. They tried a lot to leverage their walled gardens and develop different media stories, develop uh, some other propositions with great difficulty. Very few succeeded. More often than not, they failed. And therefore, with the new life coming upon us, Operators will have to figure out what do they do? What is their role in life? Are they just utility managers, which essentially they were until recently, when you manage a single service and you drive it for efficiency? Or they're platform developers and providers, and there they start competing with uh, successful platforms like Apple or Amazon and so on. But there is a chance because it's one of the skills, as I said, uh, which is very natural uh, to the operators, or they go all the way and they start developing their own services. I'm personally uh, coming from my experience and knowing how these large organizations work, very skeptical of that. I'm very skeptical that uh, oper we will see uh, en masse operators being uh, successful service creators. But how do we move to the future? I think that Niels Bohr said once that any predictions are very difficult, particularly when they're about the future. And this chart actually illustrates that very well, I particularly around, like the middle one, that everything that can be invented has been invented. Uh, as, uh, one of the US chief patent officers said uh, in the 19th century. The predictions are very difficult, but I think that what we see now as a result of this recent development creates a very fertile environment uh, for great innovation, and I'm absolutely certain that we will see a flood of it. I've been to a couple of conferences, and uh, one book been quoted again and again and again and again, so finally I decided to go and read it. Uh, the book is called The Second Machine Age. Many of you uh, uh, have uh, heard of it. And I think it's a, one of the most important books. Actually, if anything you take <laughs> out of this presentation, just go and read it if you haven't read it. And uh, there, the authors actually discuss exactly these three components. That why now we're on the verge of massive breakthrough in terms of interconnectivity, artificial intelligence, and that's coming from the exponential growth of computing power, digitization of data, that every data is available and uh, can be calculated, analyzed, stored at a very low cost. But what's most important, it's a, what I called combinatorial innovation, where you don't have to innovate new, fundamentally new technologies. Or you don't have to compete with uh, people like Ericsson, who spends billions of dollars every year on developing efficient uh, codecs for uh, compression and so on. That's not necessary. There is plenty of room for innovation just using that technology, recomposing it, and offering fundamentally new and attractive services which never existed before. And I think that with this advances and with these technologies, we'll see masses of that innovation. Sorry. 
the predictions are useless. Uh, most of them are wrong, as we could see. But some of the trends are still interesting to discuss. If you look at, uh, at this chart, you can decide for yourself which one uh, is the hoary. Some are more obvious, some are less obvious. Uh, but if we quickly go through them, that stream future clearly is happening. If you read uh, two days ago or yesterday, yesterday FT, that was a good article which actually illustrates that downloads are down and uh, streams up with an incredible growth rate. Helpful homes, same thing. You read the same paper, and Financial Times is very conservative, but uh, big article on that subject there as well. In general, we'll see a lot of things uh, moving in that direction with uh, both computing capacity and the sensors, particularly sensors. Big moves done last year uh, by Apple and Google illustrate that this is a very important area for them. They will be investing a lot of money in there. Mind sharing, this is a code word for communication, actually. If philosophically, that's a true statement, right? I mean, we communicate to share our mind, what we want to say, what we want to show. And uh, more and more formats will come there. Um, longer life, we talked about it. Uh, my information, that's probably worthwhile to spend uh, a few seconds on. I think that will be one of the most difficult uh, obstacles to overcome uh, because the laws are getting increasingly more difficult to handle. Uh, they are somewhat divergent on privacy and how to handle data. Uh, security is becoming a massive issue. Everything which I said is a great advantage to move technology forward, IP-based uh, ability of the handsets, the censoring networks, everything has a flip side and becomes a massive security threat. On the other hand, uh, the data which is being collected somehow has to be accounted for. And I think there we will see a lot of innovation coming through. And uh, with this, I think I'll stop, and I wish you all good luck, and uh, thank you for coming.